Happiness is not the point. Being content in all circumstances is the point. Are you content with the gospel in your suffering, or do you need to change the gospel in the pursuit of your own happiness? What's up, YouTube? Brian here. Welcome back to 1517 Films, where on every episode I am always contending for the faith. Once for all, delivered to the saints. And today is a viewer request episode in recognition of 1,000 subscribers. Today we are talking about heretical doctrine. Stick around. So way back in the early 2000s, when I posted my first YouTube video ever, just a, a collage of pictures of my family, me being with my friends, and some video cuts of my first deployment, and I put it all together to the song, If I Die Before You Wake, as a letter to my family before I went on my second deployment to Iraq, I never thought I was going to do anything with YouTube. Matter of fact, I think I said it to private. It might be public now. If it is, I'm going to pop up you know, a link up there. You can go watch my very first YouTube ever. I never thought I was going to do anything with this channel. And even when I decided to do something with this channel, rebranded it as 1517 Films, I never thought it was going to go anywhere. I never thought I was even going to reach a thousand subscribers, but I have. And so once it was confirmed by YouTube, you have a thousand subscribers, here's the community tab. I made use of the community tab and asked you, what did you want? And one of those options was a critique of heretical doctrine, which I threw up there because it's something that I've done on this channel a lot. And I figured, what? why not? Let's just throw it on there. Honestly, I was a little disheartened that that's what you wanted, but hey, so <laughs> that's what you wanted. If you're new to the channel, definitely subscribe, join the club, hit the notification bell, leave me a comment in the comment section below, and look for more uh, community posts in the future to see what you want, when you want it, and, and all sorts of fun stuff like that. So I have thought long and hard about what heretical doctrine I am going to critique, and even more so, how am I going to critique it? Because I don't want to just bash what is bad. There's a time and a place for that, but I think it's also equally important to affirm that which is good. And I don't want to lose sight of the forest through the trees when it comes to heretical doctrine. We need to affirm that which is good, right, and salutary. And that being the case, the topic I have chosen for heretical doctrine that any denomination can get behind is moralistic, therapeutic deism. Now, this is a phrase that was coined in the very early 2000s, and it explains what the younger generation thinks of Christianity. Moralistic therapeutic deism has its existence outside of the church. Uh, a lot of people who were churched, who are now no longer churched, are moralistic therapeutic deists. But rather than just criticizing moralistic therapeutic deism, after, of course, I define it for you, uh, we need to talk about where it came from, what its problem is, and what is the solution, and why does historic, biblical, orthodox Christianity stand as a better option than the edict of there is a God, he loves me, he wants me to be happy. That's moralistic therapeutic deism. There is a God, he loves me, and he wants me to be happy. Now, where did moralistic therapeutic deism come from inside Christianity? It came from watered-down Christianity. It came, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years ago with this kind of church growth movement mentality, this uh, Rick Warren way of going out into the community and asking them what they want the church to look like, and then making the church that. Moralistic therapeutic deism has its roots in revivalistic practices where we are going to revive the church by fundamentally changing it. And over the course of, what, 40 odd years now, we have watched it go from an orthodox church body within many different denominations to a rock concert followed by a TED Talk. And that's what most people are getting when they go to church. And why did otherwise orthodox in doctrine and practice churches go this route? Well, because they saw the mega churches doing it. Because they saw people like Joel Osteen and, and his predecessors drawing a huge following, filling 
stadiums with people all wanting to hear that which would scratch their itching ears. And what they, then, then apropos of nothing, just trying to mimic that and, and mimicking it quite poorly. More orthodox denominations, more historic denominations, more traditional denominations started implementing this as well, but they're not <laughs> any good at it. As I've often said, you know, when Lutherans try this, Lutherans are no good at everything. Um, we're kind of a one-trick pony. What we have, our history, our heritage, our birthright as Lutherans is rock solid. And when we try to change that to be like the evangelicals, we do a very bad version of it, which I think is more damaging to the future generations of the church than, the, than what is being done by the people who are actually quite good at it. So what happened? The church changed how she practices her faith. No harm there. Gotta get with the times. This is the line of crap that I was fed when I was a kid because I started asking questions. Because I went to my liturgical church and said, hey, how come how come my friends are, are having rock concerts uh, at their church? How come my friends are being taught about, you know, their felt needs. I didn't I didn't say it that way, but that's what it was. And the response I got was, oh, we're Lutheran. We've always done it this way. Not an answer. And so, of course, I left. I pursued worship as entertainment, and lo and behold, I found out that doctrine always follows practice. So maybe if you're considering making these revivalistic changes to your church to get more butts in the pew... Bear in mind from those of us who have done it and are now back, bear in mind that doctrine always follows practice and you might not be trying to change the doctrine of your church, but if you do this, you will. And the proof is in the pudding because now we have moralistic, therapeutic deists. And many of them don't even call themselves that. Inside the church, they call themselves Christians. But their theological depth is no more profound than God loves me, he wants me to be happy, and that's it. So the you go to these churches and you get sermon series on how to have better sex. You get sermon series on how to, well, how to. You get how to sermon series. So people in the church are not being taught about Jesus Christ and him crucified, which the Apostle Paul says is the only thing he is resolved to know anything about amongst anyone is Jesus Christ and him crucified. We've gotten away from the gospel and we've replaced it with another gospel, which Paul would say is no gospel at all. And so now you get these church people growing up and not being able to find that anywhere else and wherever they find themselves. They just they don't find church as entertainment. They just find church, so they don't go. But this moralistic, therapeutic deism follows them. They still want to believe in a God. They still want to be decent people. And they want a religion of therapy, not the gospel. They don't want a religion centered on the God who suffered, died, rose again, ascended into heaven, and is coming back for them. They don't want that. They want life lessons. They want therapy. Well, of course there's a God. I think that God wants me to be happy. I've heard that before to justify all sorts of horrible things. I've heard Christians say this. They're going to do, uh, insert sin here. Well, I, th I just think God wants me to be happy. God gives two shits about whether or not you're happy. He doesn't care whether or not you're happy. God doesn't care whether or not I'm happy. Happy. I know we in, in, in America, we have this pursuit of happiness idea, and that's a good idea on a political scale, but theologically, it is horrible. God doesn't care whether or not you're happy. God cares whether or not you have been redeemed and promises with that redemption, a life of hardship and persecution is going to follow. Pick up your cross and follow me, Jesus says. And isn't that a cute phrase until you understand, as Mel Gibson pointed out, what the cross actually is. <laughs> so we don't want this 
orthodox religion that tells us that we are sinners and that Christ has died for us. We don't want that. We don't need that. What we want is we want to feel good. We want help with our marriages. We want help raising our children. We want help feeling better about ourselves. Moralistic therapeutic deism works as a, a, a poor substitute for authentic Christianity because, as I said earlier, it scratches itching ears. It feeds the blatant narcissism that exists in all of us. And this, too, came out of this revivalistic church growth practice where we've gotten away from the idea of community. Has anyone ever thought, when we're by ourselves and we pray something like the Lord's Prayer, we don't change the words, do we? My Father who art in heaven. Our Father who art in heaven. Or, for those of us who still say the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints. We confess community. Christianity is community. It is a body of believers to use the biblical language. And we've gotten away from that with this worship as entertainment mentality because now what do we do? We don't have pews where we have to sit next to people. We have individual chairs all next to people. And we don't have light shining through stained glass windows or well-lit uh, sanctuaries where you can clearly see the icons and clearly see the altar. No, 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 no. We've gotten rid of all of that religious stuff, and we have a dark room with a stage and a band. And all of the lights are on the stage and the band, and there's no light on us. And I have asked, I have asked, because I used to go to a church like that, and it was a Lutheran church, why is it so dark in here? That's so that we can foster a unique and personal worship experience for each person here. So I'm not supposed to be here as a gathering of the body of Christ. Now it's all about me and my subjective experiences as uh, facilitated by the band. And I know you go to these churches and you think, oh my gosh, the Holy Spirit really worked there. It was so spontaneous. No, it's not. They Praise bands practice and do what they do so much better than anyone else. It is all pre-planned. It is all premeditated. It is all deliberate to create the perception of spontaneity. And the problem is, is that those praise bands practice more than the traditional Lutheran church organist. And so you have this worship as entertainment, TED Talk style Christianity, all I mean, the intentions were fine. We need to get more people into the church. We need to reach more people with the gospel. Unfortunately, doctrine indeed follows practice. And now the fruit of this tree which, so you have, you've heard me use this analogy before. The liturgy is like a tree, and sometimes it grows wild, and it does need to be hedged back, but it's always the same tree, and it always bears the same fruit. But what revivalism does is it tears down that tree and tra tra plants a brand new one. So now, this brand new tree from these revivalistic tactics has grown, and now we're seeing the fruit. And the fruit of this tree is moralistic, therapeutic deism, both within the church and without of the church. And the problem, the big problem, before we get to the solution, the big problem is that when moralistic therapeutic deism in the church clashes with moralistic therapeutic deism in the world, nobody can articulate a damn thing. The church cannot defend what she believes, teaches, and confesses because she doesn't know. Because she has grown fat and lazy and complacent on worship as entertainment, and she can't explain justification by grace through faith in Christ alone, the core doctrine of Christianity. She has no idea what original sin is. She can't talk about baptismal regeneration as the answer to the problem of original sin. She can't talk about the sacrament of the altar as God feeding and sustaining your faith. She can't even tell you what worship is, God serving you. 
divine service is the old word. We've gotten away from these old words like sanctification, justification. We've gotten away from all of this because it's hard. And the world, <clears throat> moralistic therapeutic deism in the world, doesn't want to do the work either. They want the sound bite. They want the audio clip. They want the tweet. They want to come at you against what you believe with quick information that sounds good and you don't think about it and you just... And when it hits the church, the moralistic therapeutic deists in the church, they don't know what to do. But when it hits an orthodox, educated, confessional Christian, then all hell breaks loose. Because now you have someone who understands these hard words, who understands the history of the church, what she's always believed, taught, and confessed, and can articulate it. And you get like a one to two sentence statement from a moralistic therapeutic deist in the world, and the, the educated Christian responds with two or three paragraphs addressing every issue that they've raised. And, the per and, I, and I've heard it myself. I don't want to read all that. We're lazy. We're just lazy. Moralistic therapeutic deism comes from laziness. And what we've tried to do with these revivalistic tactics in the church to draw more people in, but we haven't given them anything. They're here, and now we don't know what to do with them, and so they're leaving. And they're going out into the world, and they're retaining a little bit of what they learned. And all the more that they're retaining is there is a God. He loves me. He wants me to be happy. They can't articulate that God does indeed love us, but he demonstrated his love for us in this, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. They look at Jesus as some kind of moral teacher or a good person, but they don't understand that he is the unique son of God whose sole purpose in his earthly ministry was the cross. They don't want that. I've talked to Christians who have said, well, at my church, we don't focus on the suffering, death, and resurrection of Jesus. We focus on his life and his ministry and his good ideas and his teachings. It's awful. The purpose of the church is that repentance and the forgiveness of sins would be proclaimed in Jesus' name. And this is the answer. This is the solution. This is what is good. This is what is right. This is what is salutary. It's recently, uh, for those of us in Orthodox church bodies, it was Pentecost Sunday. And we learned all about the coming of the Holy Spirit. And we read from the Bible that Jesus promised the Holy Spirit and that this Holy Spirit would convict the world of sin. Oh yeah, when the Holy Spirit comes, he's going to come with the word of God, the word of the prophets of the Old Testament. He's going to come with the words of Jesus and he's going to convict the world of of sin. And after his resurrection, Jesus says, repentance and the forgiveness of sins will be proclaimed in my name to all, to all the world. Well, moralistic therapeutic deism doesn't want repentance. It doesn't want to see that the problem is me. It doesn't want to see that the problem is my sin. It doesn't want to see my sinful nature. It doesn't want to see, God forbid, my concupiscence, my inward inclination to choose sin over righteousness. It doesn't want to see that. So what do we have to, and because of that, then the gospel becomes offensive. What do you mean someone else did it for me? I can do it myself. Well, why do they think they can do it themselves? Moralistic therapeutic deism. They've gone to church being taught a different kind of law. Not being taught, this is a sin. Jesus died for your sins and you can have forgiveness in his name. No, 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 no. Now we're, we're not going to talk about what is or isn't sin, but we still recognize the concept of the law. So we're going to talk about healthy marriages and we're going to do a sermon series on healthy marriages. You've just replaced the law with the law of your own making, which is, again, to borrow from biblical language on the idea. So the answer is do better. I'm sorry, th that might seem law-oriented, but the answer is do better. Give the world something better. Give them historic, authentic Christianity. Give them Jesus Christ and him crucified. That should be what you hear in church Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday after Sunday. The same message. Jesus Christ and him crucified. That's the message. That, because moralistic therapeutic deism can't understand 
the the whole of scripture, the big picture of scripture. It doesn't want to understand that moralistic therapeutic deism, both within the church and without outside of the church, looks to the parts it likes. It cherry picks. You've often heard from the non-believing world that Christians like to cherry pick what verses in the Bible they subscribe to. Oh, well, you're going to condemn homosexuality as a sin, but look at the way you shaved your beard. Look at the fabrics that you're wearing. Look at Look at your tattoos. You're clearly cherry-picking. Or we could have a conversation on the difference between civil, ceremonial, and moral law. That's going to take a long time. Lutherans, God, we're like ants, man. We don't say anything unless it takes a long time to say. So, But they, they don't want to hear uh, how the church has always discerned between civil, ceremonial, and moral laws in the Old Testament. They just want to do what they're accusing us of. Cherry pick verses out of the Bible, out of context, throw them back at us, and then say, we're the ones that have cherry picked because we ignore these verses that they've cherry picked. Moralistic, therapeutic deism outside of the church likes to gaslight the church. And the moralistic, therapeutic deists within the church have no idea how to confront this. So when the world comes at us and says, oh, you're not being very loving, you know, you're not letting people love who they want to love, you don't understand love, do we know to go to Corinthians about love is patient, love is kind, especially love does not rejoice in wrongdoing? Rejoices in truth? That's the problem is this idea that there is not objective truth or objective facts. It doesn't, moralistic therapeutic deism does not care about the objective truth of Jesus' suffering, death, and resurrection from the dead as a verifiable fact of history. It doesn't care. Moralistic therapeutic deism is what happens when the devil gets a foothold in the church. Because the devil doesn't care. Whereas God says there is only one name under heaven given unto men whereby we must be saved, the devil doesn't care. The, the, the devil is a religion of all roads lead to Rome. Christianity is Jesus saying, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life, and nobody comes to the Father but by me. Do you see the stark difference between all roads lead to road or all roads lead to Rome and I am the way, the truth, and the life? Moralistic therapeutic deism is maybe includes Jesus and a lot of these poorly catechized, poorly churched people who are victims of the worship wars, who are victims of revivalistic tactics on the part of mainline American Protestantism, these victims of the church have now walked away because they've seen that it lacks substance, it lacks authority, it lacks objective truth, and they've walked away, but they've brought with them the idea that there's a God, I don't know where the hell they got this idea that God wants them to be happy. It's not to say God wants you to be miserable. Please don't hear me saying that. It's, it's, it's a narcissistic idea. It, it is a violation of the first commandment. You shall have no other gods. Because the thing in moralistic therapeutic deism that we fear, love, and trust more than anything else is ourselves. What is Christianity to me? What is Jesus to me? What is God going to do to better my life? What biblical principles can I rip out of context to make my life better and easier and more prosperous? Narcissism. Whereas authentic Christianity, which always preaches Jesus Christ and him crucified, which baptizes you into that crucifixion and resurrection, which, which feeds you with his very body and blood and promises to you the forgiveness of sins, that, that teaching by itself, because it is historic, because it is authentic, because it is what the church is called to teach, because it is the doctrine of Jesus himself and the apostles, that instills in people 
the desire for good works. And people who receive that on a regular, regular basis go out into the world in love and service to their neighbor. They go out into the world and they provide for the felt needs of the world. Instead of looking for the church to cater first to my felt needs and then maybe later you can give me the law and the gospel, no! Law and gospel first. Law and gospel always. Law and gospel only. And by the power of God the Holy Spirit, through the word rightly taught and the sacraments rightly administered, you will be regenerated to not look to the felt needs of yourself, but to look to the felt needs of your neighbor and to go out and serve them in love. And guess what? If you're in a community, if you're in a body of believers that is being taught law and gospel, Jesus Christ and him crucified, someone else is going to come to you for your felt needs. This is how it works. This is how it's supposed to work. But Gnosticism won't let us do that, will it? The, there's moralistic therapeutic deism which embraces narcissism and it embraces Gnosticism. This idea that anything from outside of me is bad. I, in, in a previous video, I said mainline American Protestants are very, very Gnostic in how they practice their faith. And all I got was, oh dear, you call us Gnostics. Well, stop being Gnostic. You go to a church that is fostering this individual, unique worship experience where you can get your godly little goose pimples and the message is catered to you and to your felt needs because the objective work on Christ on the cross credited to you by grace alone as righteousness is offensive to you. Because it has to be about you. It can't be that God saves you. It can't be that you were dead bones and God commanded that you have flesh and sinew and God breathed the breath of life into you. It can't be that. It can't be that God raised you out of darkness into his marvelous light. It cannot be that Jesus Christ called you out of the tomb and said, Lazarus, come forth to you. It can't be the promise of Jesus on the cross. Today you will be with me in paradise. It can't be the promise of baptism now saves you. It can't be anything that comes from outside of you. It has to be, I prayed the sinner's prayer. You Gnostic dick. So yes, mainline American Protestantism is fundamentally Gnostic and it's narcissistic and it embraces and it fosters moralistic therapeutic deism. And now moralistic therapeutic deism has left the building. It is out into the world. Your worship wars, which you instigated and you told my generation and you're now telling my children we need is hurting people. It's damning people. It's condemning people. It's driving them to look for the answer inside of themselves. Because as I said in the beginning, doctrine always follows practice. If we change how we practice our faith, we will fundamentally change our faith. And I can't do that. I have changed my faith because I changed how I practiced it. And thank God for the people at Concordia University, the faithful confessional Lutherans who would not let me continue in that moralistic therapeutic deism where I was the arbiter of what was biblically true and not Jesus Christ. Thank God for the faithful pastors and professors in the Concordia system who didn't entertain my arguments but simply presented me with the word of God. That's what changed me. That's what made me Lutheran. And there have been a lot of comments in the comment section lately about how pompous and arrogant I am. Probably. Believe me, I know myself better than you guys know me. But the fact that I believe, teach, and confess to you this one true Catholic faith, I do so because I have been convicted by the word that I was wrong. I was practicing wrong, which led me to believe wrong, which led me to teach wrong. 
It is God the Holy Spirit through the word and through the grace of the sacraments that made me a confessional Orthodox Lutheran and brought me out of moralistic therapeutic deism. And the problem is, moralistic therapeutic deism doesn't want to cause offense. It doesn't want to hurt your precious little feelings. It doesn't want to infringe upon your truth. So it offers nothing. But, and then this, this whole tirade, gosh, you're a hateful person, Ryan. I don't see the love of Christ in you. What you see is love of Christ coming out and it hurts the ears to those who don't love Christ. There is no such thing as your truth. There are only people who hate the truth. And the truth is that historic, authentic, biblical Christianity is centered upon Jesus Christ and him crucified for you and for the forgiveness of your sins. And if you're going to a church where your pastor does not tell you in his sermon every Sunday that Jesus died for you, you're not probably not going to a Christian church. And you're going to a church that is eventually going to lead you down the road to moralistic, therapeutic deism. I don't want you to feel good about yourself. I don't want you to feel bad about yourself, but what what I'm not, let, let's rephrase that. I'm not solely interested in you feeling good about yourself. I'm not solely interested in your felt needs being met. I'm not solely interested in how you would prefer to worship God. I am interested in who God is, what he has done in his son, and confessing and giving that to you. Because that is so much better, and that will fundamentally change how we engage the world. And we need to be prepared. If we're going to defend this truth, we need to be prepared to have the world fundamentally, unequivocally hate us. There are people that I am friends with that do not like me, that accuse me of being divisive and argumentative, members of my own family that will accuse me of being argumentative and divisive because I stand on the pure doctrine of Scripture. And there's probably some truth in what they say that I could get better at doing that. There's always room for improvement there. I'm a poor, miserable sinner too. But doctrine divides. We want to talk about Jesus, the good teacher. We want to talk about Jesus that sat down with sinners and tax collectors. We're going to ignore the part that they fundamentally were changed by their experience with him, repented of their sins, and followed after him, and founded a church that was centered on the teachings of the apostles. We're going to ignore that. No, 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 no. Jesus ate with sinners and tax collectors. Jesus didn't condemn the prostitute. I don't want to hear the part where he said, go and leave your life of sin I just want to hear the part where he didn't condemn, condemn the prostitute. But if I say, actually, Jesus was more interested in forgiving the prostitute, dying for her, and calling her to a life of daily repentance and faith in him, now all of a sudden I'm being divisive. Now all of a sudden I'm holding to a doctrine. It's deeds, not creeds, Ryan. That's a really good creed. So what do we do? We continue to preach the word in season and out of season. That's what we're called to do. We rightly divide the word of truth, meaning we understand the law and we understand the gospel. And all of this is always centered on Jesus Christ and him crucified for you. And this gospel truth, when it is preached in purity, when it is connected rightly with God's sacraments of baptism, confession, absolution, and holy communion, it changes you by the very Holy Spirit that promised to convict the world of sin. It changes you fundamentally as a person. It convicts you of your sin. It points you to the propitiation for your sin. It promises you the forgiveness of your sins, relieves your conscience, and frees you to go out into the world in love and service to yourself. No, to your neighbor. 
And when we re-embrace the idea of community, when we turn the lights in the auditorium back on, when we kick the praise band to the back of the sanctuary so that we can rightly focus on the altar and the fruit of the cross which sits on that altar, we will fundamentally change how we address the felt needs of the people. And we will eradicate moralistic therapeutic deism and we will foster a church body, a single unit of believers surrounding themselves with one true confession of faith. We will teach them to articulate it, and then the moralistic therapeutic deism of the world cannot stand. It will hate us. It will drive people away from the church. It will. It is divisive. But Jesus said, I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Jesus came to divide, and at the end, he will divide the sheep from the goats. He's only ever guilty of proclaiming the truth, and he only ever calls us to proclaim the truth. And it's not our job to water or tend to the garden. It's our job to throw the seed and let him water and let him be the vine dresser. You see how it's different? How Christianity is thick. It is robust. It is a multifaceted diamond. It's hard to, to, to talk about one issue without addressing five other issues at the same time. Christianity is tricky. Christianity is challenging. Christianity takes a dedication to study and to learn and to grow and to learn the definition of hard words rather than just erasing those hard words and watering down the message and making it more understandable to the common language of the people. Moralistic therapeutic deism dumbs people down because it assumes people are dumb. Historic, authentic, biblical Christianity builds people up. And if they are dumb, it educates them. It raises them up so that they can understand. It gives them the hard word. It gives them the hard doctrines. And it starts by catechizing our kids. That's where it starts. Christianity is thick. It is tricky. But it has more substance than moralistic, therapeutic deism. There is a God. Yes. You are not him. This God does love you. Yes. He demonstrated his love for you in that while you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you. But he does not care whether or not you're happy. He cares where you're going to spend eternity and whether or not you will be raised to eternal life on the last day. He cares whether or not you have been buried and raised with his son and whether or not you're being fed in word and sacrament by his son. Your happiness is incidental. Happiness is not the point. Being content in all circumstances is the point. Are you content with the gospel in your suffering or do you need to change the gospel in the pursuit of your own happiness? This is the difference between moralistic therapeutic deism and authentic, historic, biblical Christianity which is fundamentally and eternally salvific by comparison to the all roads lead to Rome damning doctrine of moralistic therapeutic deism. Until next time, may God richly bless you in the grace and mercy won for you by Jesus' vicarious death on the cross for all of your sins.